Okay, recording. So let's share this session. Today's session is going to be a fun one. It's on a, on a big picture of the open source economy. So just making sure I'm recording here. Good, good, good. Okay, so big picture coming from, so we're at the open source microfactory startup camp. We're productizing our kits, torch table, printers, and getting ready for production um, as we also get geared up for running steam camps, more summers of extreme design build, and upscaling our activity. So today I'd like to have a more of a fun session, a big picture of the open source economy. What's, what do some of the institutions in the future world look like? How does OSE play in that with this open hardware logo? Uh, an economy based not only on open software, but on the material physical infrastructures being open, transparent, collaboratively developed. So uh, the economy refers to productivity, the means of productivity. So the first thing is like maybe the, you know, the number one thing we learned from the 60s or maybe the, the hippie movement is that when people ran away into the forest to start new communities, one thing that was missing was an economy. So let's address it. Uh, that's a big point that if, if you are trying to change civilization, um, you cannot get away, cannot, cannot deny the need for effective production as a substance of what an economy is based on. Uh, meaning, livelihood that's easy for people, that it, the struggle for survival is not the primary preoccupation, it's instead thriving, self-determination, and higher values are the more important things to us. So we talk about collaborative design as the core mission of open source ecology. Collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. So there's a few big picture concepts that we talk about. We talk a lot about distributive. Uh, so th there's distributed, meaning that it's localized in many places. Distributive is the quality that promotes a distributed system. So a distributive enterprise, what we call is an enterprise that tends to distribute its business model openly by teaching others, uh, keeping its blueprints open both on the hardware front and uh, enterprise, so both the product front and the enterprise front. So we, we differentiate between economic systems that are um, re... well, th okay, there's a distinction. So distributive versus distributed. There's another important distinction, on a, actually on a bigger scale, and that is a distributive kind of economy versus a redistributive economy. So you can say that in today's society, we live in a redistributive economy. That means government takes taxes or other ways uh, people pay into a common pool so that services are redistributed throughout civilization you know, through, through the populace. But when you think about it, it's based on, on a system with kind of a you can say a systematic error or a system design issue there where if you ask more broadly why why is it that we are creating an economy where then you need to help people because they're left out in the first place that's the bigger question to ask so in the open source economy we talk about distributing in the first place so it's not the trickle down or bread crumbs off the table kind of effect but that everyone has a relatively even playing field upon which to succeed and make a beautiful life for themselves. So that's the distinction between a redistributive economy, which I would say the, the current world is in a, in a framework of redistributing resources. That's the role of government. You know, countries with big governments has put a lot of effort into redistribution of resources to, to the population. But how about designing a system that does not need that? Therefore, it's a smaller government, you can say, uh, but an economy that addresses human needs in a more profound way from the get-go as opposed to relying on third parties like governments to, to make sure that happens if um, there's unequal distribution of wealth. So that's, that's one distinction. In, um, in the future economy, we envision just like what's happened, uh, Linux is a great framework for this. So right now, Linux is a kernel uh, a common project run by the Linux Foundation. Big corporations from Facebook to Google to Apple and Microsoft. Microsoft is the biggest contributor to the Linux project uh, in terms of the number of developers. There's a common pool of open source 
upon which all the companies and essentially the entire software economy runs. So that's the same model for hardware. So think about what would it look like for a common repository of critical uh, technologies for products of all sorts, whereas Linux is a product that's a software product for hardware, that's everything. That's your cars, your houses, your, your computers, the food on your table, and everything else. A uh, common pool of design from which people then can generate other products. So right now, product development happens by many companies working uh, pretty much in isolation. Um, essentially, you can say reinventing the wheel every time a new product is made. So, so the idea is let's lower the cost of development um, and also make access to new innovation better simply because the, the pool of underlying knowledge is common and shared in a way that everyone has access to that. So that would be the equivalent. Uh, we're doing a, the, our experiment, the Global Village Construction Set, the 50 machines and related know-how around that as a small kernel. That's an example of a small but sufficient set to create just about anything you have in civilization. So that's, that's our experiment. And we see this kind of a pattern, you know, once, once this is well developed, companies would like to draw from that since if it's good design, naturally people want to draw from it. And the question, of course, is how do we get there to get that level of refinement, reliability, uh, and diverse usage that's uh, usable by many, many companies. Of course, that's much more hard than software because for software, um, it's just a small problem. For hardware, it's infinite number of numbers of choices of how you can do different things in different locations. Software can be more degenerate, i.e. like a smaller, uh, well, let's back up a little bit. Software also, just like you might say, oh, well, software is so much harder. But when you look at hardware, the metaphor is not so far off because in software too, you have also an infinite number of choices of how you can do things, right? You write your lines of code to create a web browser or a server. Well, you can do that in many, many ways. So decisions have to be made about what the best way to do it is. And a similar kind of thing is going to happen with hardware where you then settle on some of the best practices, settle on a degenerate set, meaning a, not, not the full range of things, but things that you accept, okay, this is a good way to do it, which is also a, a cool thing. I mean, you don't want to be reducing diversity, but you do want to meet all the needs that are out there. Um, the, the concept of a kernel forces you to make choices and say, okay, this is the common pool that we will all live with and it's good. And, and therefore you have the, also the choice of, of things being so-called the best, right? So you have a diesel engine. Uh, it might be the, the best diesel engine because it took the input of everybody and it does not lack on this one or other characteristic. Uh, so let's t let's take a look at well uh, some more features. So so the main one of the main features of innovation in the current system is called a patent system, where a lot of people claim that oh well that helps innovation because you're providing a temporary monopoly to to a company so that they can pr take their product to market fully. Um, and many people of course critique this. There's it's definitely dubious, and then with patent trolling and and corruption of the patent system. Um, you can question what its true value is in, in this day in history and cases can be made for when patents are not, not around that innovation goes higher. Like the first example is I like to point to is the steam engine where when Watt invented his steam engine they had a patent on it. When a patent expired a bunch of innovation happened and the efficiency of steam engines doubled essentially. Uh, they did not have Wikipedia at that time, a wiki they published in a journal, they shared information, and, and after the patents ran out, you can see historic. This is actually a good historical study. This is not just pulling something out of the air saying that, oh, it just got so much better after that. You can, you can look at the data for that, that there was a clear correlation to the patent expiring and innovation happening. You can see a modern example of that with the whole 3D printing industry around the 2010s. And this, this century, the patents on 3D printers ran out innovation exploded such that now the entire printer desktop or uh, consumer printer industry is pretty much based on an open source rep wrap project. So there's examples which you can cite to. In our view, it's of course, I mean, if the company locks off some information, keeps it hush, 
I mean, obviously, it's you don't have to think too hard to say that, oh, if everything was absolutely open, more innovation would happen. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. Uh, but then people get confused on, well, what kind of economic model do you have behind that? Can you actually make a living and so forth? Well, if we think about flat business models where it's just like, oh, it's we have to have exclusion or proprietariness or... Uh, basically competing with others. If we think that's the only way to do it, that's the only, that's we're going to like patents. But if we open our mind and say, oh, we can have abundance for everybody, um, then we act in a different way. And there is a case for abundance based on first principles, namely that currently we have 10,000 times more power coming from the sun than we use today, i.e. energy is not in short supply. Therefore, uh, we can have much, much more prosperity today and there is enough for everybody based on first principles of energetics because energetics energy is what's used to convert rocks sun rocks plants soil water into the common objects that we use today in the modern economy so if you do not have a uh, shortage of energy you, you can have abundance and that's so from first principles that that's absolutely possible but our economic print economic system has not really caught up to the first principles to make abundance avail available to all Let's talk about some more uh, areas of the economy or more, more about the big picture of open source economics. So what would the field of agriculture look like in an open source economy? Today, in today's economy, we, there's a lot of debate about this organic versus, so chemical agriculture versus organic. Uh, there's issues of erosion, deforestation, biodiversity loss and all that. And that could be... A lot of that can be addressed through to doing agriculture properly. What we favor uh, as part of our platform is what we call perennial polyculture with swarm breeding. That's four words, essentially, but let's unwrap that. So perennial polyculture. So in the way we think about things, we think about perennials as opposed to annuals as a cornerstone of food production. Now, why is that? So annuals. With annuals and tilling of soil, you have certain issues like erosion or the, the destruction of the soil food web. The idea there is today in the United States, there's an average of four tons of topsoil loss per acre happening every year as a result of tilling. You till the field, the rain washes all the soil down, wind blows it away. So there's a strong case for going less to the tilling, more to the perennials. And seminal books have been written on the topic of, of tree, tree crops, perennial agriculture, J. Shalto Douglas, or other topics like permaculture coming onto the scene. But um, the idea is for us, we, we are actually doing experiments here with hazelnuts and chestnuts as a sta stable, stable crop that can be used instead of corn and soybeans. So there's certainly alternatives from the, the mainstream perennial, uh, main, the mainstream annuals to perennials. That can be done by design. We can do that. And even today, like if you talk about a corn and soybean field, it, even if you plant 20% like 20, 20 in trees, you're not reducing the, the productivity of the stuff, uh, of the annual crops because the sun gets through the top cover of the trees. Uh, so in the current economy, without decreasing any productivity, we, can, we could already have 20% more forest cover over the United States or up many other countries. So, so perennial polyculture. Polyculture means also not just one crop, which is highly susceptible to, to insects and pests and other things, uh, a more diversified crop allows you to have more synergies and it's harder to do so I mean this is talking about we get we get away from um, less uh, thought intensive processes to more advanced I mean more advanced more integration more design to make a sound ec ecological system than just plain you've got a monoculture which reflects a monoculture of the mind swarm breeding that's I want to bring up this topic so in today's world, there's a constant fight against weeds and, and other insects, pesticides, herbicides are a big deal. 
the big industries around that. Uh, but we're basically designing that use into the system. Um, how does that relate to, to swarm breeding? So what is swarm breeding? Swarm breeding is a concept of, this, this actually comes into the, the trees, like more of the tree crops. Swarm breeding is where you have massive populations of, of plants. So this is like heirloom plants that are fertilizing themselves. So there, there's sexual propagation happening there. Uh, you have constant evolution happening as, as flowers get fertilized and fruits get made and plants get planted. In today's world, a lot of the, the perennials are based on grafting. So that's, that's a thing where now you're depending on some company that typically now patents these things. So they, they breed something and then they clone it. Now, the only issue with cloning is that, yes, it might be great, but you're always selecting for one kind of like one thing without selecting for the integrated system, such as such as selecting for it being resistant to pests and temperature resistant and drought resistant and so forth. So the idea with the the way things are done today is that you're breeding for selective traits and therefore building in things like dependencies on pesticides and herbicides, which is not a cool thing. So the idea of swarm breeding is that is that you're taking populations that simply fertilize. You don't have to do the, the, the selection towards one thing that you then clone and, and, and leave at that evolutionary state. The idea of cloning is that once you clone something, you're replicating the exact same genetics, but you can't do that because genetics change. Things change. The environment changes. The, the pests and pests evolve. Uh, different there's a lot of different interactions. So basically, once, once you start cloning, you're getting into a, an evolutionary dead end, and that's why you have to use the pesticides and herbicides to help those weaker so-called plants to survive. So in a way we do things today, we have a system based on a chemical industry as opposed to the more broad concept that, that says that, okay, you're going to breed things where you, you have, say for the nuts, the nut trees here. So we're, we're growing a bunch of hazelnuts from Badger Set Research. Uh, what happens there is you leave the populations out in the fields, they cross fertilize, you take the offspring, you select the offspring for the, the favorable qualities, and you keep doing that generation after generation. Each generation fertilizes with the whole swarm. But the, the end point of that is that after 100 years to 500 years, you stabilize at plants that come true from seed. So you have a population that's constantly evolving and therefore you don't need to spray it typically because it evolves to take care of itself. So that's a big topic and you don't hear a lot of this kind of discussion like rare few people like uh, people who talk about heirloom plants or people like Badger Set Research, Phil Rudder. Um, they do that, but in mainstream agriculture, everything like all the fruit trees, uh, useful useful trees, a lot of stuff is grafted. Um, so we're building in this constant dependence upon chemical agriculture to, to make that happen. And there, th then there's another thing, um, the like the no-till versus till, till debate. So no-till means that you're spraying the you spray a field with glyphosate just round up to kill all the grass and then you plant. So you say, oh, you didn't till, you just killed the whole field with chemicals. Well, that's not, first of all, it's kind of a questionable practice. Well, I mean, it works. You can then plant directly into a field without having the erosion issue, which I mentioned four tons per acre per year. But then there's other issues like pollution and things like that. But be, even before that, groundwater pollution. You know, so this stuff gets into your groundwater, you can't drink it water anymore. But the, the bigger issue there is, is the thought process behind that. Um, why are we not evolving plants that are resilient? So instead of the clones or even the terminator seeds, which after you plant one generation, the seeds are sterile, uh, that kind of crazy stuff, that's part of the system. Um, why not design it where you can collect the seeds? It's open pollinated heirloom varieties that you can keep planting and they keep evolving. So that's a human choice. So that, that issue there would eliminate the, issue, the, the thing of pesticides in, in a big way. 
but it's a long-term process. So obviously the economics are, a lot of economics are short-term based. So people think of, okay, we're going to just do like genetic engineering fast, you know, in a year you get a new plant uh, as opposed to a hundred years or a thousand years, you, you get a new plant like happened with corn, for example, by just breeding, uh, regular selective breeding. So those kinds of patterns, if we think on a much longer time scale, we can evolve now to crops that are much more resilient against all kinds of change, not only pests, but climate and other features of the environment. So I just want to throw that out because it's an important thing that nobody really talks about this, this thing uh, outside of a few, few circles like heirloom people. Um, so definitely as you go forward into uh, open source biotech, <laughs> uh, think about the other things, the integrated perennial polycultures based on swarm breeding that come true from seeds. Because if you have a powerful tool like genetic engineering, then you have to be extra responsible for how you use it because with, with great power comes great responsibility. So that's the agriculture front. Also, on, um, another issue about the agriculture, what we see in the future economy is things like the digital rights management and things like tractors that a farmer cannot fix themselves and they can miss a harvest season, like that kind of stuff, where you know, John Deere is patenting uh, whatever the software on their tractor that if it breaks down, you can't even modify it, so people are hacking it. But that kind of stuff goes away with open source hardware design and open source software that runs, that's associated with that. So that kind of comes out in the wash in the next economy. Let's talk about housing and agriculture. Um, housing, well, housing comes from agriculture. So, so a derivative of, of the agriculture fund could be housing. Now, how about if we do housing developments that have agriculture built in? So that's a concept that you can hear about in the United States called agri-hood. Uh, it's a cool thing, meaning that it's a community like a typical 40-acre cookie-cutter development, except it's got built-in agriculture as part of the economic model. So that's great. That's a, that's a good model to go with in terms of very short food miles. Like China, for example, I heard has like 30, their food miles is like 30, 30 miles, meaning everything comes around their cities and stuff like that. In America, it's like thousands of miles. Um, but it's good to have resilience on your food front where, where your food comes from very close by you, so you're, you've got that kind of food security. Um, so in terms of housing, what we what we look forward to is that cities are in the, of the future are more livable, more walkable. You don't rely on a, an hour or two commute to get to work every day. Uh, we like the model of the OSC campus based around the idea of a college campus. So the kind of facility that we're building here and we'd like to replicate is best described as you know, best modeled after a campus because the campus has you've got your residential places, you've got your workplace. You might have some labs for research, you might have some production, you got food, you got people living there, uh, all kinds of different activities. So, so let's think about integrated communities, and part of that being my local open source micro factories and so forth. So that's the model for future, um, future buildings, of course, with open source designs of buildings. So you have blueprints that you can build from and perhaps um, digital assist there. Um, we, we do like things, I mean, we, we build with compressed earth block. We think that 3D printing for house walls and house structures could be a good idea. 3D printing for all kinds of uh, panelized, uh, insulated systems. Yeah, 3D printing for construction materials is definitely relevant, like the waste plastic turned into plastic lumber, definitely, definitely a good idea. Uh, let's talk about then the production aspect. Uh, and we believe that the production aspect should be integrated more into the communities because if you are doing production in your communities, you're going to pay attention to not soiling the place you live in. So I think that in uh, the future economy, we want to build in the productive aspects along with our habitats and agriculture because you're just simply not going to destroy your own backyard. Uh, so the idea of local production also forces you to be more responsible because you think more, okay, is this clean, good for the environment? Is it going to kill me because of the fumes or whatever? Um, if it's, if that, that kind of activity is not in some remote place where you're just killing the locals or whatever, uh, if it's in, in people's communities, uh, we will pay attention more to it. It's more transparent, so we'd like to see that. And, and the bigger context there is the open source micro factory, meaning small production facilities on a scale of, I mean, it could be small like we have here, which is 4,000 square feet or so, 
I can produce just about anything with digital equipment, 3D printers, digital machines, industrial robots, and and basic production tools like CNC torch tables and welding, torching, and, and heavy heavy machines, fabrication, or electronics. Uh, that can all be done in a very small facility. The idea is we have a, a global pool of open source design that we can all draw from, developed in all locations around the world, and that's the next industrial revolution, the distributed production, digital fabrication, the promise that's been talked about for a long time, perhaps since uh, about 13 years ago, a uh, seminal book on that called Fab, the next coming industrial revolution. I hear that's something Fab by Neil Gershenfeld talked about the promise of digital fabrication. Um, that's still not been much delivered. Um, still, digital fabrication remains not widely used. It's uh, not the not the engine of product productivity today. We think that that's going to be more common in the future as open source equipment becomes more accessible and more good digital designs become accessible for anyone to use. So download a car design, build it in your local factory. So we see a place like Walmart transitioning from uh, a place which just distributes things to a place that produces things. So think about the advanced digital micro factories um, with custom on-demand production. Because there's only so many feedstocks. you got plastics, metals, ceramics, and a few other things. But you can think about a, a framework where in a very small facility with well-developed design and good uh, workflows and open source equipment, you can have a person come in and even either either do that order by the staff that's working in, in that new Walmart, the Neo Walmart, uh, where it's produced on demand, or it could be a thing where, like what we do today for our revenue model is, is running workshops where you, you learn to build something, you get that product, but because you have access to that store or facility that you can build that with. You also have the ability to modify and, and change that and maintain that for a lifetime. So the lifetime design aspect is a direct, direct derivative of the open source micro factory, which otherwise is not really possible because you have to send something back. It might be too difficult. Parts are not available. You don't even know who produced the thing. Um, so the local economy, the local micro factory lends itself to the circular economy and the idea of lifetime design, which we think is a huge value proposition of the open source economy. Um, what about uh, other hairy issues like population? So first of all, there's a warning like today. Well, I'm very optimistic, but today we have only we use only about a tenth, one ten thousandth of the energy that the, the, the sun shines at us today. So from first principles, you have to be aware that the population of the Earth could be like 10 or 100 times bigger and still be perfectly fine. Now, in a sustainable world, I mean, right now we already have many, many problems as we're only at a very small fraction of the, uh, of the baseline first principle carrying capacity of the world. Uh, so that's a good thing. That means we can make things better or we can keep degrading things. It's our choice. Uh, but the idea is if you design in resilient, regenerative, uh, life-giving systems, then the population issue solves itself pretty much because cities or communities will, um, with more direct feedbacks to their natural life support systems, will tend to self-regulate. It's like a stable e ecological system. I mean, that's the idea. Create resilient structures that don't explode like with artificial mechanisms like uh, speculative economies or fractional reserve banking, all these various mechanisms which are just unstable by design. Um, if you built a resilient regenerative system, then we don't have to worry about population because we'll, it will take care of itself. Uh, pretty much it will self-regulate at a, at a stable level, whatever that is. And that level depends on um, how smart we are about design. Like right now, we can say we're over the capacity. We, can, we could have said that maybe two, even 200 years ago when we, the Industrial Revolution came where major pollution and destruction started to take place. Or we could have said that maybe in 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia when the whole river basin was a lush, lush jungle and now it's turned into a desert or the whole Sahara. Like you can say, oh, we destroyed the earth back then. So, or Easter Island where that was a thriving population that pretty much killed itself by deforesting the entire island. So, the carrying capacity is negotiable. It's, it's about how smart and regenerative we are about how 
we go about life. Um, what about religion pol and politics? We'll not talk, we won't talk about it, but quick brief on politics. Basically, uh, on politics, politics follows money, right? So if you have an open source economy, the kind of politics that arises from it will be based on the economy that, that we have. So in other words, in an open source economy, let's just say politics will look different. Um, and then once again, it's up to us. However we design the economic system is how our political system is going to look in a, in a big sense. Um, I'll, I won't go more into that. It's, uh, I kind of see that, you know, if, if you are concerned about politics, work on an economy because politics are based on money. The politics is basically a lot about resource, how you redistribute resources. So in an economy that's fundamentally distributive, uh, politics will get much better. So that's, that's, a, that's for sure. What about religion? And then what's distributed religion as opposed to centralized religion? So while that's called spirituality, I would say it's something that we see God within. Uh, you know, we, we've got God within ourselves or whatever. Uh, hairy topics, don't talk about it at the dinner table. Uh, okay. So let's just wrap up here. So a um, couple of points. So what are we doing on, on this open, to create the open source economy? Well, first of all, by 2028, we're we're intending to finish all the 50 global village construction set machines. In other words, you can be able to build download open source blueprints to build civilization, as promised in the TED talk. Uh, you, that includes the revenue models behind each of the, the machines. And so, okay, so how do you build houses? How do you produce machines? How do you run an agricultural operation? Uh, how do you build various gadgets? Uh, various tools, enabling tools that allow you to have the modern standard of living. So that's, that's uh, to be completed 2028. Right now we're about 33%, one third done. What we're doing right now is, um, you might have heard about our steam camps. So that's one, one area we're developing in a major way. We're starting to produce kits and, and products for the open source everything store. So that's the concept we're starting to push forward as the idea of Let's, let's find open source people who have open source designs that are marketable that can be put into a commonly developed open source production network. So we focus on a full open source Oshawa, open source hardware association, open software initiative compliant designs, uh, quite distinct from a lot of the platforms out there include non-commercial work, uh, which is just not that it's not one of the four freedoms of open source. One of the last freedom of open source is the ability, the economic freedom, meaning that you can make money on it. It means you can sell it. Uh, that has to be there. Uh, so we're looking for brave people to contribute to that pool. Yesterday we just actually ran into the open source uh, bicycle project from Spain. We want you people. It looks like they're fully, they're talking about, it's actually open brand. Uh, what's the name? Name of that project? I think you it, but... Uh, what's Dueta or something is a open source, a, what I would call a distributive uh, project. Uh, they're actually promoting that you build you, their bicycles and use their brand. So that's open brand. Wow, that's pretty cool because open source ecology is not necessarily open brand. We're not open brand, i.e. if you want to produce some of the things we, we designed, you can do that, of course, by yourself, but you cannot say, oh, this is made by open source ecology. That's our brand name, but you can get certified to produce it. So, so to say that you're open brand, that's the most radical uh, form of openness. Uh, but we're looking for people to collaborate on an open source everything store. Uh, next summer also we're, we're going to do three months of uh, our biggest, best yet, uh, three, three months of summer of extreme design build, so building all kinds of things from houses to aquaponic greenhouses, tractors, 3D printers, and everything else. So for people who want real hands-on experience in outside of college or other endeavors, yeah, this is the place to get it. Um, the big, big project for us for next year in September that actually is a derivative of the STEAM camps is the incentive challenge. So you might have heard of this, the, the incentive challenge to build the world's first open source 3D printed professional grade cordless drill from scrap plastic, so the plastic recycling infrastructure is built into that project. It will be a challenge that we're planning to post on HeroX and give a big prize uh, 
so that there's thousands of people developing on that. And we're looking at a $250,000 prize to make that happen as a, as a first example of something where a product is developed on a rapid time scale and it actually surpasses the meets or ex exceeds industry standards. So that's, that's a model we need to show. We need to show a specific example where open source is actually showing, uh, demonstrating that we can produce better economic results and that then people can take that to start a business. So we're paying a lot of attention to the business front on that project as well, where we're saying we would like to um, have about 50 or 100 people that produce these cordless drills in many, many areas around the world. So that's that's uh, that. So if you're a fellow microstate entrepreneur willing to and interested in making the ne next economy happen, join us, talk to us. Um, we know there's a few few other open source projects out there, people who really promote the idea of open design, that other people produce that certain good. That's how we will build the next economy. It, it only takes a few dozen people to do that, and then the economic power of that grows because it's truly about open design, open collaboration for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. So I think I'll leave it at that. Any questions from the audience? Otherwise, uh, please uh, send comments down in a, this is on YouTube, post comments and questions uh, below the video. And otherwise, we'll see you, see you soon. Thank you.